All right, uh, because this is a longer presentation, I'll jump right into it. I think most of you know who I am by now. If not, I have a biography on my website, so you feel free to look me up there. Uh, I will just say my name is Ryan Hislop, and I have been here with the UCSD since the early Suzanne Choppy days back in 2009, and now with Vanya. Thank you, Vanya, again for having me for another year. And uh, today we're going to discuss Medicare. And um, so this presentation isn't meant to discuss your specific options within the UCSD uh, ecosystem or framework. Uh, this is to give you a background in Medicare and things you should be thinking about from a different lens. And that lens is one of um, how should I think about it in, in the framework of my retirement? What are my costs going to be? What are the potential risks? What does it cover? What does it not cover? But when it comes to your individual choice, on whether you do a Medicare Advantage plan or a Medigap plan, uh, what we call traditional Medicare, that's something I would highly encourage you uh, to do at UCSD with the representatives there that know the UCSD-specific uh, Medicare plans. Uh, Vanya, I assume you guys still have the, uh, the presentation done by the uh, folks at UCSD? Perfect, great. Um, so I would, I would encourage you to, this is kind of a primer and then uh, after this presentation, uh, uh, it's really good to because you have a background on Medicare and everything else. And again, you can review this afterwards. Uh, Vanya is uh, recording this, and therefore you can watch it on the uh, RRC website. So I'm going to jump right into it because we have a ton of slides to go through. So I'm going to start here with um, with uh, three key points. And what are the three key points? If you don't enroll in Medicare on time, you're going to pay a monthly penalty. If you do not get the right private insurance. Um, to go with Medicare, right, you, uh, you may pay too much in premiums or out-of-pocket costs. Very important one right there. And then if you don't plan for higher health care costs in retirement, you could run out of money or not be able to get the care you need. And I'm going to go through some specific examples and go through some sp specific costs uh, in later slides. So here's our agenda. Part one, we're going to go over Medicare enrollment. Like, what is it? Who needs to enroll? How do you enroll? What is the system? Uh, part two, we'll go over how much it costs. What does it cover? And more importantly, probably, what does it not cover? And then how does this public-private partnership that we call Medicare, when it's really Medicare plus a private uh, insurer, how do, how do they work together? And what are things you should be looking for? And then finally, in part three, we talk about reasons uh, your health care expenses will be higher in the future, of course, inflation, and you know what does it not cover, specifically long-term care. Just as a, a, a note here, um, I pulled up the healthcare inflation in the United States uh, in the last four years. I left out 1948 all the way through, but you can see here healthcare inflation is a real thing, uh, just like regular inflation is, uh, which we haven't discussed in you know many years. Even back in 2019, where interest rates were on the ground and inflation was very muted, healthcare inflation was still at 4.6%. Even as recent as 2021, uh, prior to the in inflationary spike that we've seen uh, as of late, it was at 2.2 and in 2022 at 4%. So it's something you have to really, really think about and plan for from a standpoint of what the cost is going to be to your retirement. So let's talk about part one first. Let's go over some basics in Medicare. Let's talk about enrollment first. So what is healthcare and who, how does it pay for in the United States, right? And I know healthcare can be a, um, a very divisive issue based on politics. I try to completely avoid politics in these lectures because I want to make sure we get actual information out there first. So before age 65, uh, traditionally, uh, whether you're at UCSD, obviously at UCSD, you know that you have your health care plan. Uh, it's uh, considered a large uh, health care plan uh, with creditable insurance. Um, uh, you either have retiree health insurance if you retire before age 65, maybe COBRA, which is just stands for Consolidated Omnibus Reconciliation Act. It passed back in the 80s, and it's a continuation of existing care, more um, uh, found more in the uh, public sector, excuse me, in the uh, private sector than public. And then individual health insurance, so think of uh, health exchanges. Uh, and then other, what's an example of other? Well, it would be what I would have uh, from retiring from the Navy. At age 60, I'll have TRICARE, uh, which is military coverage for retirees that retired uh, after 20 years in the military. So that's just an example there. Now, after age 65, for most, if not all, of the people in this presentation, Medicare is going to pay first, and then your plan will pay second if you continue to work. Uh, if you're retired, then your plan will pay, excuse me, Medicare pay first, and then your retirement Medicare plan will pay second. Uh, other insurance uh, pay second, and that would be the example, again, of the UCSD uh, Advantage plans and uh, traditional Medicare plans. What does it mean for you, unless you're covered by an employer group plan that covers 20 or more employees, which certainly UCSD does, you must enroll in Medicare when you turn age 65. 
And what if you don't enroll in Medicare on time? And this is one of those things that's not automatic. Um, you every year are going to have to, and if I can't leave you with anything from this presentation, probably the number one thing uh, is that Medicare is a yearly choice that you need to make based on the plan and what the plans are covering. I highly encourage you to be proactive. Usually it's around fall time. You'll start seeing all the Medicare uh, commercials, and then you have to sign up by sometime in November for the next year. This is something you have to be proactive about based on your health and your health needs. Um, so what if you don't enroll on time? You may pay penalties, and the penalties can be pretty severe. Healthcare expenses may not be covered. Uh, and your private insurance options, and this is really big, may be limited, and it may be limited uh, by, by pre-existing conditions after your initial enrollment. So it's very important to understand your initial enrollment in Medicare is very, very important because you cannot be excluded for any pre-existing conditions. All right? I want you to remember that because that's an important fact because after your first year, you can be excluded for pre-existing conditions in what are called Medigap plans, which is traditional Medicare, but not in Medicare Advantage plans. Um, I'll repeat that a couple more times in the presentation if you missed it, and of course you can review it on the uh, website. Uh, National Healthcare Insurance Program for people age 65, Medicare, if you don't recall, came around uh, under Linda Bates Johnson in 1965. Uh, we had the OASDI program, which is Social Security, Old Age Survivor Disability Insurance. And in 1965, they added HI, health insurance, uh, to that, and that comes out of your payroll taxes, FICA taxes, right, uh, FICA and FUDA. Um, and so you pay your uh, Social Security 6.2% up to the Social Security wage max. Your employer matches it, or if you're self-employed, you do both sides. And then you have the Medicare, right, um, which is, I believe, 2.45 on each side as well. Uh, and there's no limit on Medicare uh, taxes. It's as much as your income, you make a million dollars a year, you pay on all that million dollars in income, you pay your uh, Medicare taxes, unlike Social Security. It is enrolled through the Social Security Administration. Um, who's eligible for Medicare? So everyone that's over 65 that is a U.S. citizen or a legal resident who's lived in the U.S. continuously for at least uh, five years. Uh, some people under age 65, not the scope of this presentation, but if you are under 65 and you're eligible for Social Security disability benefits, then you may be eligible for Medicare benefits. If you have a question on that, uh, please reach out to me outside of the presentation. I can uh, give you the, uh, the parameters around that. So here are the four parts of Medicare, right? So part A, which is hospitalization insurance, or HI, right? Uh, that is part of the, and you see down here at the bottom, it says provided by Medicare. Um, that is the public partnership. That is the government partnership in the uh, public-private partnership of Medicare. So part A is a hospitalization insurance. Part B is your medical insurance, your doctor's visit, et cetera. Uh, part C, if you so decide part C, uh, it would encompass usually all of the above. That's called Medicare Advantage. And then part D is uh, your prescription drug plan. Well, what happened to Medicare policies? Well, they're in addition. And this slide, I think, shows it, it, it better. Um, simply, uh, option one, original Medicare, or what we call original Medicare, which is your hospital insurance and your medical insurance, so doctor visits, et cetera, plus your hospitalization insurance. And then you add a prescription drug plan, a PDP, so there's no C, Right, so your A, B, and D, and then you add, you see at the bottom here, a Medigap or Medicare uh, supplement plan. Now, what would be an exception to that? Again, I'll use myself as an example. As uh, a retired uh, Naval, Naval officer, when I turn 60, I have TRICARE, which covers Part D and Medigap. So I will only have Medicare when I'm 65, which will become the first uh, payer, and then TRICARE will be my secondary, right? It will replace a Medigap or Part D. But for most of you, you're going to choose either the left side here, which is traditional Medicare or Medicare Advantage, which we have on the right side. And think of uh, Medicare Advantage or plans are like HMOs or PPOs, and they typically include all parts together, right? So think of a, a Kaiser. Uh, it would be a perfect example here of a Medicare Advantage. We call it Part C, but all it does is encompass A, B, D, and what would be your Medigap policy. So it just encompasses everything. So how do you enroll in Medicare, right? If you're receiving Social Security benefits when you turn age 65, right, it's automatic. It gets deducted from your Social Security benefit, your Part B premium does, right? And your Part A, depending on uh, if you qualified for Social Security or not, can either be free or uh, you may have to pay a premium if you worked uh, for 10 years or less. Uh, coverage starts on the first month uh, that you turn 65, and Part C and D are not automatic. Again, you must choose a private insurer and uh, – you know, again, if you depart with nothing else, you have to be proactive when it comes to Medicare. Every year, you have to 
uh, go through it and repurchase a, a, a program. All right. So how do you enroll in Medicare? Again, if you're not receiving Social Security benefits, you've come to my Social Security presentations and you understand the value of Social Security and you're delaying to 70 uh, because you're the higher earning spouse, and I encourage you, if you have not been to my Social Security presentation, maybe come uh, on Friday, I'll review basics of Social Security and then do some advanced planning of Social Security. But if you're delaying to 70 or 68 or whatever it happens to be, uh, you have to, to, to set up payment through Social Security Administration, right? Um, and if you're not, uh, uh, your initial enrollment period, there's three different enrollment periods. Your initial, if you're not covered by a group plan at 65, right? Your special enrollment, if you are covered by a group plan at 65, and then what's called general enrollment if you missed initial or special, which is what I call the penalty box, and we'll see here in a second. So here is the window for signing up for Medicare, right? So the month you turn 65, my birthday's in November, so optimally, I'd want to uh, sign up in October, September, August. I could sign up as early as August 1 because my birthday's in November, and care would start on November 1st if I was turning 65, which I'm not. Uh, on the other hand, if I forget or uh, um, it, you know, gets by me or whatever, I'm busy, um, you have a delayed start for three months, um, and that's considered still part of your seven-month initial enrollment program. So who signs up for Part A during the initial enrollment? Almost everyone who turns 65, there's very few examples that you wouldn't, so I won't go through those. Um, again, it says check with your benefit administrator, but this is a presentation more geared towards uh, uh, private employers and folks that maybe work for smaller companies. But at UCSD, you're definitely going to want to sign up right uh, before your 65th birthday, one of those three months prior to your 65th birthday. Um, you may be advised to enroll in Medicare Part A to enhance the hospitalization coverage. That's, of course, what uh, UCSD wants you to do. However, and this is more for folks that are, uh, maybe you have a spouse that's a business owner or, um, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> a little dry up here in the mountains today as we have a big windstorm coming in. Um, if you maybe have a spouse that works for a small employer and doesn't have credible coverage, or if they have a, a high deductible plan, just be aware that once you sign up for Medicare, you can no longer contribute to an HSA. It doesn't mean your HSA goes away. You can use the funds that are in the HSA for your Part B premiums. You can use them for your Medigap uh, premiums. Um, you can use them for anything healthcare related. You just won't be able to contribute to the HSA anymore. So that's something you definitely, if you have a spouse that's not a UCSD that's working somewhere else, you want to talk to your benefits administrator about that. Who signs up for Part B during the initial enrollment period? Um, people who are not covered by a comprehensive employer sponsor plan. Now, again, I won't go into this too much because this doesn't apply to UCSD, and that's probably 90% of the people that are on here. Uh, but if you're not working, you're self-employed, employed by a company with less than 20 on COBRA, uh, re receiving retiree health benefits. So, again, if you are uh, UCSD and you've retired early um, and you uh, uh, turn 65, this is the time you need to uh, uh, enroll in during your initial enrollment period. And, again, that's optimally up to three months prior to the day you turn 65. Who signs up for Part D? And just as a reminder, Part D is a prescription drug plan. Anna, I see you raising your hand. You have a question you want to go ahead and ask? Could you please speak a little bit slower? Yes, I can. Thank mm. you so much. Sorry for interruption. Yeah. No, 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 no problem. So I have a tendency to speak quickly because there's like 64 slides here, but I will try to slow down as best I can. Thank you for letting me know. Um, who signs up for Part D during the initial enrollment period? And just remember, Part D is prescription drug plan. Um, people who sign up for Part A and B and want prescription drug coverage. Maybe you don't want prescri prescription drug coverage, and that's fine. Um, but most likely you do, and so you're going to sign up when you sign up for A and B. Uh, you must sign up when you are first eligible or face the late enrollment penalties that you do also with Medicare Part B. And there's two options for Part D. Again, there's that standalone coverage that is included, not included, but that you buy separate with a Medigap policy, traditional Medicare. And then there's Part D that's part of Medicare Advantage. So it's usually just C. And think of Medicare Advantage C as comprehensive, right? It covers everything, A, B, D, and your Medigap policy. So I like to think of Part C Medicare Advantage as comprehensive, right? Special enrollment period, this is just for people who did not sign up for B and D because they were in creditable coverage, meaning they were employed by an employer that has creditable coverage. Um, 
again, this is outside usually of UCSD scope, but I just want to go through it in case you have a spouse that works for a non-UCSD or works for a private employer. The special em enrollment period for Part B is any time before current coverage ends or the eight-month period starting the month group coverage ends. And Part D has the same thing, but in Congress's wisdom, they made it 63 days, which is roughly two months, instead of eight months. Why they did that, I have no idea what 63 came about. But just be aware, if you have a spouse that's at a private employer, you're going to want to make sure that they are signed up and enrolled in Medicare if they're 65 or over prior to leaving current employment. Best time to enroll to avoid late enrollment penalties, very simple. In your initial or special enrollment period, uh, you want to do it before your 61st birthday. Now, if you forget everything, you go into the penalty box. It's called general enrollment period. I call this the penalty box because coverage starts on July 1, but you sign up in January, February, and March. So if I turn 65 in November, I forget. It's January, February, and I go, oh, my gosh, I haven't signed up for Medicare. My prior insurance has expired. Well, I'm out of luck. I have to sign up in January, February, March, and then coverage starts July 1. So I'm going to have a nice big gap. Um, not a good place to be. So that's why I call it the penalty box. Don't end up in general enrollment. So just a quick review, and I went over these. Initial enrollment period, you want to go three months prior to your 61st birthday, unless you're born on the first of the month. If you are a first of the month baby, then you can actually do it four months prior, not three. Special enrollment for those that are in a private employer with creditable coverage, right? Best time to sign up, again, before your coverage ends. And then we talked about general enrollment and the penalty box. How do I sign up? Very simple, ssa.gov. Click on Apply for Medicare Benefits or Call Social Security. Really easy. So how do I sign up for Medicare Part D, those prescription drug plans? Well, again, you have to decide which side of Medicare you want. Do you want the traditional side or the Advantage? You do the Advantage, you're going to get a prescription drug plan in that Advantage. If you don't, you're going to need to do a shop for a standalone prescription drug plan offered through a private insurer. So you're going to be shopping not only on traditional Medicare, not only for a Medigap policy, but you're also going to be shopping for a prescription drug plan, a standalone prescription drug plan. If you go uh, Medicare Advantage, then it's going to most likely be included, but it's something you certainly want to verify. Part two. All right, so we're done with part one, and now we're moving on to Medicare and private insurance. So we're going to talk about the public and private um, partnership that is Medicare. So in a study done you know, several years ago, it's a little outdated, but kind of gives you an idea of the average out-of-pocket spending on services and premiums among traditional Medicare beneficiaries. Right? You can see over there the graph, services are 58% roughly and 42% per premiums. Right? Total out-of-pocket spending in 2016 was per beneficiary, by the way, not per couple, about 5,500. Uh, again, this is before we get into any other ancillary services. So out-of-pocket costs paid by Medicare beneficiaries, what are they? Oh, first of all, you have premiums, right? You got the Part B premium that you'll have for the rest of your life. You have your Part D premium uh, that you'll pay on your uh, prescription drug plan if you decide to go that route. Uh, or your Medicare Advantage plan, that will be a premium as well. What are the other out-of-pocket costs? Well, you have deductibles, the portion of a doctor's bill that's not paid by Medicare, that's why we get an Advantage plan, that's why we get a Medigap plan, is simply to cover some of those or all of it, depending on how comprehensive your plan is. And then services not covered by Medicare, simple things like dental, vision, hearing. You know, these are things that are not covered by Medicare, and so we want to make sure that we have some type of insurance to cover these things. So here are the monthly premiums. Again, as I said, Part A, if you qualify for Social Security, meaning you have 40 quarters of work here in the United States where you've paid into Social Security, your Part A is free, right? So 10 years of work history, your Part A is free. You don't have to worry about Part A. If you were less than that, 30 to 39 quarters, 278 a month, less than 30 quarters, 506 a month, really good incentive. Maybe if you're <clears throat> really close to that 40 months, or 40 quarters, excuse me, really good incentive maybe to just work a little bit longer to make sure you qualify for free Part A, or else it's going to be a pretty big tax on you going forward. Part B in 2023, it's $164.90 a month. And I know some of you out there may say, I'm paying a lot more than that. Why? And it's because of this thing called IRMA, the Income Related Monthly Adjustment. Okay. I'm going to go over that in comprehensive detail because I think it's one of the most 
uh, important part of the presentation here at the uh, here in about three or four slides. And then part D, same thing, it varies with the plan. And then you also are paying income related monthly adjustment on part D as well. So actually not in a couple slides, I'll do it right now. So beneficiaries, and this is 2023 numbers, who file individual tax returns, right? If you have a modified adjusted gross income of 97K or less, you are not subject to the IRMA. And if you're married filing joint, modified adjusted gross income, which is a little bit different than the AGI, 194,000 or less. What this does not tell you, and I think is really important for people to understand, if you have a large capital gain in any given year, modified adjusted gross income does not exclude that from your income. So you sell a home. Maybe you're a stock trader and you do a lot of churning of stocks and this and any other, and you're creating a lot of capital gains. You can put yourself in a significantly higher income-related monthly adjustment. You can see down here, you know, 183,000, or excuse me, 366,000 to 750,000. I know that's a lot for folks, but like I do, like San Diego homes have appreciated a lot, and you go sell a San Diego home, you probably have a pretty sizable capital gain, and you could easily put yourself in 750 or above if you've owned it for 20 or 30 years, and now you're paying $400 a month more than the 164.90. So your premium is 560.50 a month for each beneficiary if you're married, husband and wife right? Um, or, you know, partner, whatever it happened to be, but five sixty and 50 cents each. So that's now we're talking well over $1,100 just in your part B premium alone. All right. And it doesn't, it's not just part B, it's also prescription drug plan. And that's what you're seeing here. So your prescription drug plan pay a 676.40 if you're over that 750 mark, multiply that times two plus whatever the premium is for the plan. So one thing I always advise my clients 65 and over about is be wary of what capital gains can do to your modified adjusted gross income because it could greatly affect your um, premiums uh, two years down the road in Medicare Part B and D. All right, so let's talk about some other expenses within uh, Medicare. Just like any insurance program, you have deductibles. So Part A, even though it's free if you've worked for 40 quarters, you still have $1,600 deductible per spell of illness. So you go into the hospital, you're ill, you come out, and 190 days later, you get ill again, uh, and you go back in, it's another 1600 That's just a deductible, right? Part B, 226 a year, a year in deductibles. Now, that's waived for several different uh, screens, right, and, and uh, tests, but just be aware, it's 226 a year. And then Part D, or prescription drug plan, about 505 a year. So significant deductibles here. And we'll go through kind of a, 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 an income statement of all the different um, expenses together so you have an idea of what they are. Coinsurance, right? What do you and the insurance uh, company split? Well, part A, it's 400 a day for days 61 through 90. It is no coinsurance for days in zero through 60. And it's 800 a day for days 91 through 50. Skilled nursing uh, after day 20 is 200 a day, right? And as you can see, it only goes to day 100. And that's why long-term care is not included in Medicare. Just make sure you completely understand it because I think that's one of the biggest risks to retirement fund. Uh, and Part B, assigned claims. So 20% of Medicare approved rate. That's just, you know, whether your doctor uh, takes Medicare or not. And you may have a coinsurance, a significant one, um, up to an additional 15% if it's not, not approved. Uh, Part D, coinsurance. Under stated uh, drug plan design, beneficiaries pay the 500 deductible, 25% of the drug costs after the deductible, so you pay 505, and then you're gonna pay 25% of all costs all the way up to you reach the 7,400. 7,400 is the catastrophic limit, and then above that, it's fully covered. <clears throat> so what does Medicare cover? Because we've talked about all this money's coming out of your pocket, what does it cover? So hospital, 100% of the first 60 days. Medical services, right? So 80% of the Medicare approved amount, that's why we have um, you know, either Medigap policy or Medicare Advantage is to help us, help us with that other 20%. Uh, some preventative services like flu shots and certain screening. Uh, by the way, you can go on the Medicare.gov site and there's Medicare in you and it gives you a complete list um, of all the covered services. So what does it not cover? Because this is really important because these are the things that you want to think about um, outside of Medicare, or your Medicare Advantage plan or your Medigap policy things you want to think about uh, that you would want additional insurance for. Long-term care, absolutely. And I believe, Anya, you still do a long-term care presentation that Jody used to do. Someone else is filling that gap. Um, 
to, to explain long-term care benefits and the reason you'd want to do a long-term care policy. Uh, care delivered outside the U.S. Uh, my mother's from Mexico City. She always tells me she wants to move back to Mexico City uh, for her retirement, uh, this and that and the other. And I always tell her, Mom, there's one big problem. You're going to have to pay for all of your insurance out of your pocket. And she goes, what? And I said, yeah, Medicare does not cover anything in Mexico. So you need to be here in the United States for that. So that's uh, something to, to certainly consider. Uh, dental care, vision care, hearing aids, obviously cosmetic surgery. If you're into alternative medicine, uh, which certainly I know works for a lot of folks, uh, you, you, know, you may want to look into a plan that maybe covers some of those things. Uh, amounts over the uh, Medicare approved amount. And then, of course, amounts not covered by deductibles and the coinsurance. So what private insurance, again, public-private partnership may pay for? Well, the Part A deductible, that's $1,600 per spate of illness, could be potentially fully covered um, under the right insurance plan. Hospital costs after 60 days, uh, the amount the doctor charges over Medicare approved amount or the 20% of the doctor bill that Medicare doesn't pay. And then prescription drugs, maybe the deductible, right? And most of the costs of certain drugs during initial benefit period and the, the, the catastrophic coverage. But you're still gonna have something coming out of your pocket, particularly if you're a higher income earner or you have higher modified adjusted gross income because you're gonna have, still be subject to the IRMAs. Insurance does not help you reduce IRMA costs. And then Medigap policies, right? Uh, what are they and what do they do? They're just a private health insurance company, right? Blue Cross Blue Shield is a perfect example. They're sold by private insurance companies. They supplement Part A and Part B and your prescription drug plan. And there are all federal, state, uh, federal and state laws that are there to protect you to make sure that, that these plans have certain uh, facets to them. Um, it's, uh, Medigap insurance companies can only sell these standardized policies. They're usually identified by letters. Uh, in several states, they have their own plans that work differently. Um, they don't work with Medicare Advantage. Again, I want to be very clear on this, and I'll say this one more time. During your initial enrollment in Medicare, you cannot be denied for any pre-existing conditions under Medicare Advantage or a Medigap policy, right, traditional Medicare. Once you get out of your initial enrollment period and you're on that annual re-up, you can be denied for pre-existing conditions under a Medigap policy. Medicare Advantage, you can never be denied for pre-existing conditions, just to be clear. So in Medigap, you pay a monthly premium and costs vary by plan, company, and location. Here's just an example of the letters. The most common uh, is, is F. All right, those are the Cadillac plans, if you will. How they came up with this lettering, I have no idea, but just wanted to show you um, uh, examples of the plans. Medicare Advantage plans. So I just talked about Medigap policies, which are supplements to traditional Medicare. Medicare Advantage, also known as Part C, remember comprehensive. There are options, health care options approved by Medicare, again, run by private companies like Kaiser. Medicare pays the amount to each member's care, and you may have to use the network of doctors or hospitals like Kaiser. It may include your PDP, so you don't have to have a standalone plan. Most likely it does. And the reason people tend to like Medicare Advantage plans over Medigap uh, is they come with ancillary benefits like uh, vision or dental or maybe chiropractic care or something like that. Um, reasons people prefer a meta gap policy over Medicare Advantage is because they tend to be a little more comprehensive um, and you can get these Cadillac plans that are much more comprehensive and so it's a, a benefit sometimes to uh, and again you remember you can be uh, you can be um, denied for pre-existing coverage on a, a Medigap policy after your initial enrollment period. So shop carefully for private insurance. Medigap policies are standardized but the premiums vary. Right, drug plans benefit. Uh, you know, the, depending on your location and what your conditions are, the, the plan benefits vary considerably. This is where you really have to take your health care into your own um, arms and make those decisions into your and do the proper research. I highly encourage you. I am not one, so I'm giving you total um, non-biased advice. I highly encourage you to find a trusted uh, Medicare Advantage or Medicare. Um, if, if you, you know, obviously UCSD, you already have these folks, but if you have a, uh, a spouse that's in a, a private plan, um, have them find somebody, a trusted uh, agent that, that can walk you through all the different plans and what, based on your conditions, what's best for you. All right, so most Medicare Advantage enrollees are in plans with at least four stars. That's a good thing. You can see here in 2022, we peaked uh, with, you know, roughly 80% or so, uh, 85%, excuse me, in four-star better plans. That's one thing you definitely want to ask is, you know, if I'm going to go into a Medicare Advantage plan, how many stars does this plan have? That's four or five, you're probably in good hands. 
If it's down in uh, three and a half and below, you may want to reconsider. So what are the out-of-pocket healthcare spending by gender and age? You know, this is a little bit of an older slide, but you can see here rapidly as we age, and we especially go from that 75 to 85 range, you can see that our spending on services becomes a large, large amount of our total average out-of-pocket healthcare costs. And it's no longer premiums, it's the actual services that we're getting and what we're paying for, you know, co-pays, et cetera. So here's a typical Medicare budget as of 2020. Insurance premiums, right, uh, back in 2020 at 144, Medicap premium at 200, Part D drug plan premium. So that's 384.60 for your premiums. So now we have to multiply that by 12. That gets you to 4,600. Now your out-of-pocket costs, your dental, your vision, and maybe some alternative care. And quickly we're at 6,200, and that's per person. So if you're married, you got to double that. It's 12.5 just to get out the door, right? And that's not including any income-related monthly adjustment. So just be aware that this is something we really need to plan on properly for retirement. It's how we're gonna pay for our healthcare. What can cause it to change? Obviously, Ryan, rising healthcare costs, and I, I went over the inflationary rates earlier, right? You can expect it to be somewhere between four and 6% a year, hence why we need to have our IRAs, our 403Bs, 457s invested, so we have rising income in those as well. And according to these sources, Fidelity and an Employee Benefit Research Institute, you could see anywhere here between 285 to 300,000. This is a couple of years ago, so you could probably add another 50,000 or so to this uh, to get to what would be current uh, fees. So let's call it 350 to 400,000 um, in retirement that needs to be set aside. And again, if you're thinking, well, I've got a 403B or 457, that's 500,000, and I'm good. Well, remember, you have to pay ordinary income tax first before you then pay for your premiums or care costs or, you know, whatever. And I, I understand that there's some adjusted gross income levels at which, you know, you can pay for healthcare costs and get the deduction, et cetera, et cetera. Just, just be aware that cost of healthcare and retirement are usually a lot more than people think. So planning for long-term care. I'm not going to go much into long-term care just because I want to leave some time for questions and I know you have a separate presentation on it. Just remember it's not, it's not covered whatsoever by Medicare or Medigap after 100 days. 100 days is it. You're getting sent home uh, or you're getting sent somewhere uh, because they no longer will cover you. All right. And so I'm going to stop the presentation. Actually, let me just go to the end here. I don't want to go through the long-term care stuff because it, it really should be a separate presentation. But three reminders on Medicare. Number one, make sure you enroll in time to avoid those late penalties. Okay. Three months prior to 65th birthday, optimal time, two months optimal, one month optimal. The, the month of your birthday, okay, and after that, uh, not good. Stop carefully for your private insurance to go with Medicare. You're going to have to review this every single year, uh, and you're going to have to do your own research on this or have a trusted advisor that will help you through this. Number three, plan for higher health care costs in retirement. Remember those inflation rates I showed you? You're looking at 4 to 6% on an annualized basis that you most likely uh, expect on uh, Medicare premiums. Uh, not premiums, but all your Medicare costs, right? Your premiums, your coinsurance, your deductibles. Just be aware of that. And in particular, be aware of the IRM of income-related monthly adjustment. If you have a large capital gain, you sell off a bunch of stock, whatever you happen to sell, some artwork, whatever it happens to be, remember you may be subject to that IRMA. And with that, I'm uh, finished on the presentation. So I will stop my screen share. We'll go back here and... Um, I will either monitor the chat or feel free to unmute yourself and ask any question you like. Thank you so much, Ryan. I hope my audio works better now, but that was really it important does. information that you shared. Yeah. So, yes, of course, everyone, if you have questions. Anna, I see you unmuted yourself. Yes, Anna, <laughs> please go ahead. Thank you so much. The, I have a question. Uh, I do... I did enroll, I'm 77, and enrolled in the Medicare from, for uni, from university and uh, Advantage plan. Now it looks like I'm healthy for now. Uh, so I, I think maybe I should change to Medigap from, mm -hmm. so what case, in this case, should I, what actions should I make? I have no idea. Uh, that's a great question, Anna, and hopefully someone else is thinking the same question. So I would encourage you to see your, and Vanya has probably their phone number, 
uh, to see your representatives at UC that are familiar with the actual plans within UC that can walk you through each Medigap policy that you may be eligible for. And what, there you go, Vanya just put it in there. Great, thank you, Vanya. Um, she just put the link in there. Um, you're gonna want to reach out directly to them. You're gonna want to, them to walk you. I think there's either four, five, or six, I forget the number of Medicare or Medigap plans that go with traditional Medicare in the UC system. You want to, to walk you through each one of them, what they cover, what they don't cover, what the costs are, what the deductibles are, what the potential co-insurance, all those things. And I think, you know, UC, you guys are very fortunate. You have very uh, excellent staff there that can help you with that. I have no advisors. I don't know even how to reach them. I'm trying to understand all this through the web page. But it's really hard because so many of you guys trying to help, but it was overwhelming. And, yeah, so, uh, and, uh, you have the chat, uh, click on the chat button at the bottom of your screen, the chat. The chat. chat, yes. Uh, click on that and you'll see Vanya put the, uh, the number there, 858-534-9686. I would call that yes. number, sch schedule an appointment, do it as quickly as possible because it is enrollment season. Schedule an appointment with them to have them walk you through each and every single one of your options. Oh, God. <laughs> Thank you. Absolutely. Absolutely. But I should not, uh, again, think about Medicare. I should enroll again. I already there. Isn't right? So I just need yeah. to just change insurance from Advantage to the Medigap. That's my purpose. Yeah. I am in the Medicare. Yeah. Yeah, so that again, reach out to that 858 number that Vanya okay. put in there. That's the best the best I could do for you right now. Okay, um, sorry. Thank I still, I, you know, worries, no worries. Thank you for your question. Um, I see we still have a whole bunch of people left in the, the chat. Let me put up my, my email. If you have any spe specific questions or you haven't been able to join us uh, for Social Security, you can uh, you more than happy to answer your questions. There's certainly no charge to it. I've been uh, doing this at... Uh, UCSD for the better part of 15 years, and I'm happy to answer any of your questions that you have. There's my you email right there. You need to have good information, good, good booklet, paper uh, to send to us, because you don't do this. We need a thick book with explanation of every possibility. Can you do this? Yeah. Oh, uh, Anna, yeah. yeah. So yeah. the healthcare facilitator, her name is Ronisha Robertson. She'll be able to walk you step by step if you make that appointment. Um, so yeah, Ryan is correct. They should be able to walk you through it. Okay. Thank you. Yep, Thank you for your question, Anna. Thank you, Vanya. Um, did anyone else uh, have a question? You want to put anything in the chat? Um, if not, again, my email's there. I'll wait a couple more seconds here. Don't all jump in at once. <laughs> I still see we still have the better part of 20 plus in here. All right, well, my yeah. email's in the chat. If at worst case scenario, uh, if you wanna reach me because you have a question that uh, maybe you didn't wanna share with the group, uh, it's always confidential when you email me. Um, uh, my email's there and, and feel free to reach out to me and I'll hopefully see each and every one of you this Friday at Advanced Social Security. Uh, thank you, Chris, good to see you as always. Um, it was, uh, do Advanced Social Security, we'll go over some different Social Security claiming uh, tactics and strategies and how it, uh, how it combines with your overall retirement plan. So thank you, Vanya, as always, for having me. Happy Monday, everyone. I hope to see you all on Friday. Take care. Of thank course. You. And just to end, I'm listing our other uh, seminars that we have coming up. So make sure to attend those as well. Thank you. Great. And this meeting was recorded. We will go ahead and share it out with participants right after the recording is uploaded to our YouTube channel. Okay. Goodbye, everyone.